Good morning. That's not I oh, she turned me off. Okay, there we are. We're good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Nimi. Appreciate it. We are so excited to have you here in the system. Um, I'm looking forward to learning as much from you uh, as, as vice versa in that uh, I don't know if you know her background in, in academic innovation and thinking about teaching and learning. We're really, really thrilled to have you here. So thanks for joining us to the system. Great. Uh, so thank you all for being here today. Uh, many of you got up bright and early to make the trip here to UMES. We appreciate you doing that. Uh, my associate director, Nancy O'Neill, who is somewhere way in the back of the room, and I uh, yeah, left at, what'd you say, oh, dark 30 to get here. So um, I know many of you are, uh, came, came, got a, had a very short night's sleep and uh, came somewhat in the dark in order to be with us here today. Um, welcome to the most regional OER forum. This is actually the second of three of these that we're doing. Uh, the first one we did was out in Western Maryland. So it turns out, I thought Frostburg was the end of the road. Um, when you get out to Frostburg, it turns out you make a left and drive for about another 45 minutes and then you get to Garrett College, which is where we had uh, that, that event. Really successful. Um, we had done the first, uh, actually the very first OER most uh, summit in December of 2014. 17, thank you, thank you, buddy. Uh, in 2017, very successful. We had about 500 people there. Um, but it occurred to us at that point that we kind of needed to take this show on the road, that we had re reached an awful lot of folks, but we'd also had to turn a lot of folks away, frankly, just because of capacity. So that's what this regional forum is about. Um, as I said, we were in Western Maryland. We're here over on the Eastern Shore today. We're gonna do one in Central Maryland as well. Uh, and then we'll figure out what the next round of these looks like as we move forward. But we're trying to, trying to get out into the field and to work more directly uh, with folks in, in the regions. I want to thank UMES, our host, particularly Kathy Passeri, uh, who has made this uh, event run so smoothly today. I think uh, we're in for a really great day. I also want to thank Annika Manny and Melissa Goldberg, who are sitting here as well from EdBridge Partners. Um, if you're wondering what the heck EdBridge Partners is about, uh, the Kerwin Center had, uh, has been partnering with them almost since the beginning of our work. Um, and as I was telling Dr. Nimi a few minutes ago, if you'd told me that uh, you could do project management from a distance, at, if you'd asked me that uh, at that point, I would have said no way. But it turns out uh, they've been a tremendous asset for the Kerwin Center and, and great thought partners as well. So thanks, you, all three of you, for, for today and making this possible. I need to also thank uh, Maryland Online, the Maryland Association of Community Colleges, and MICUA, which is the Maryland Independent Colleges and Universities in the state. Um, the most initiative is being run out of the Kerwin Center right now, but it's in partnership with those three organizations. Um, you know, we're really trying to make very clear that this is a statewide initiative. This isn't just a USM initiative. We have many of our community college uh, colleagues here today. Um, in fact, the community colleges are really, um, I think, leading a lot of the OER uh, effort in the state right now. So we're really, really thankful to have uh, the community colleges working with us and uh, now also the independent institutions as well. So um, for those of you who are here uh, from Mikuwa, is anybody here from an independent? We had quite a, f we had a couple of fr at the Western Forum and I think we're gonna have quite a few at the Central Forum. So anyway, really happy to have those folks um, with us as well. So as you heard, I direct the Kerwin Center for Academic Innovation. For those of you who don't know what that is, um, we started in 2013 and our charge, oops, I'm supposed to advance slides, right? There we go. Our charge is, uh, was at the time um, to work with the institutions to think about, in particular USM institutions, to think about how we increase access, affordability, and achievement simultaneously across our institutions, and particularly to explore the ways in which technologies can help us to do that. Um, that, that charge has remained the same. However, I think our, our conversation has ex expanded into, as I said, not just the USM institution, institutions, but also collaborations with the community colleges, because I think increasingly we're realizing that for our students to be successful, we need to make sure that we have done what we can to uh, pave the way through transfer pathways and other things for students to be successful. So, um, so we've been working very closely with leadership at your institutions, with your teaching and learning centers, with others across the state to see how can we 
collectively accomplish more than we might be able to do individually. I mean, I think that really is the, the bottom line here. So um, it's with that spirit that the MOST initiative launched in 2013. This was actually something that um, the USM, the University System of Maryland Student Council came to us and asked about. Um, I was brand new at the time and thought, holy cow, this is a great idea. Uh, we'll get to work with students and this is something that we can really dig into. Um, so that was really uh, where this began and the way in which we're approaching most. I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, towards the end of, of my talk here. So when I came, uh, as Dr. Nimi mentioned, I had been at Lehigh for 13 years. Um, I gave up a tenured position to come to Maryland, um, which at the time I thought nothing of until we got to that first budget session and they start talking about cuts and I thought, oh wait, I'm employee 106 out of 106 employees. I gave up tenure, what was that about? So, um, but no, seriously, I haven't looked back. Um, this has been an amazing place to work. Um, you know, this is, it, even from the outside, it occurred to me that this is sort of where the action is, that here in Maryland, there's an awful lot going on, um, that in fact, uh, it has the state of Maryland, I didn't know this, but has been called in the past America in miniature. Um, because it's small enough, as we know, for this morning to allow for travel to meetings, uh, for day, day meetings, um, and the, the diversity of our environments, the beach, the mountains, urban, suburban, rural, we just really kind of have it all in some respects. Um, and it makes it a really great place to do this innovation work, quite frankly. Um, you know, I had the chance to build on the momentum that was already established by colleagues of mine in the, in the uh, system office, Britt Kerwin, of course, for whom the, syst uh, the center was named, and others who had envisioned that the potential of the system office could be something more than just an organization that keeps the lights on and the trains running on time. That this might be a place where we could really begin to create some momentum and some, some conversation around what does higher education look like in you know, the, the 21st century? And how do we do a better job of supporting the needs of our students? Um, so actually starting in 2006 with the launch of the system-wide course redesign initiative, it was clear that Maryland was interested in addressing the pressures on higher education collectively and serving populations that most need the opportunity to advance through education. So Maryland's been a great place to do this work, uh, but Maryland, as it turns out, doesn't make such a great cutting board. <laughs> this was the uh, housewarming gift that I got from my mother-in-law when we moved in, and I thought, okay, well, that's nice. You can see it's hanging on the wall because um, <laughs> if she'd gotten it while we were still in Pennsylvania, it might have been a little, uh, little more effective. So I've already talked a little bit, I got ahead of myself about the Kerwin Center's mission, um, but you know, really the idea here is for us to think about how we capitalize on the recent findings from the learning sciences, the capabilities of emerging technologies to increase access, affordability, and achievement. That's really, really what we're about. But as you can see from this, um, if you've scanned it, OER is not in my mission statement. I view OER as one of the many arrows in my quiver, if you will, to help us advance other kinds of conversations, help us facilitate change, along with online learning, uh, learner analytics, alternative credentials, competency-based approaches to curriculum design, all these kinds of things are things that help us advance the conversation. Also, as you know, given my background, I tend to view the challenges we face in higher ed very much from an instructional designer's perspective, which I think will become apparent to you as we talk through, uh, as I talk through uh, my, my uh, remarks today. So in 2013, the Kerwin Center set out on its mission in what was being called at that point the year of the MOOC. You may recall this time. And if you've been paying attention since then, you know a lot of the conversation around, uh, in the media around innovation in higher education has been largely focused on, you know, if faculty would just embrace these new technologies, we could fix and, and incorporate these bright, shiny objects into their teaching, we could fix what's wrong with higher ed, right? You've been hearing this, right? Unfortunately, it turns out the history of technology use in education over the last hundred years paints a pretty bleak picture of the extent to which technologies in and of themselves can actually lead to the sustainable academic transformation that we seek. It was in fact a little over 100 years ago in 2013, or 1913, excuse me, 100 years ago, 
Shortly after he had invented the motion picture that Thomas Alva Edison claimed in an interview that the best use of his new invention would be for educational purposes because it was now possible to teach every branch of human knowledge with the motion picture and that books would become completely obsolete and scholars would be instructed with the eye. He was so enthusiastic, in fact, over the motion picture's instructional potential that he predicted educational films would change schooling completely inside of 10 years. Similarly, in the 30s and 40s, it was widely expected that the combined effect of radios, voice, sound effects, music, and so forth might gain learners' attention and stimulate their imagination. So when educational radio came on the scenes, pundits claimed it had undreamed of possibilities for education that would resurrect the oral instructional techniques employed so successfully by famous teachers of the past like Socrates. Stuff sound familiar? My personal favorite, this actually could have been lifted directly out of one of those Thomas Friedman articles, remember back in 2013? There will be vast universities of the air with courses taught by the national leaders of their field. Remember how he was talking about that with respect to MOOCs? So these patterns have been repeating over and over again as we think about technology and education. As you can see, a lot of these pictures are coming out of K-12. It started there. This is not new, this, this whole conversation. We think it's new because it's now in higher education, but it has been around for, a, these discussions have been around a long time. And in the 50s and 60s, again, during the baby boom, television was touted as an efficient and inexpensive way to satisfy the nation's instructional needs. In the 70s and 80s, mainframe, then personal computers, which is about when I came into my doctoral program in the 90s, were predicted to provide students access to the personal services of a tutor as well-informed and as responsive as Aristotle. So it turns out, as one traces the history of technology use in education, there are some incredibly clear patterns that emerge. First of all, big claims, enthusiastic claims of the educational benefits. This is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and it's going to revolutionize education. Education as we know it will cease to exist. Then you get the rush to adoption. The new technology bowls everybody over as they hurry to figure out what to do about it without a set of guidelines or a foundation in, the res in research to suggest best practices. Third comes the logistical difficulties with classroom implementation. Little consideration given to the practicality of working with the new technology in the classroom. So as you look at some of these things, you discover stuff like those radio shows would last longer than class periods. So teachers would have to turn off the radio as the kids moved on to their next class. No effort to align content of programs with curricula or in K-12 uh, uh, language with the standards that they were trying to address. Then, of course, there was a huge expense of uh, purchasing and maintaining. Those little transistors and those radios cost them a lot of money, and when they blow out, they were completely down. And in some cases, there were even some safety issues. Um, I, I was, as I was doing some of my dissertation uh, research, I uncovered a story in the, one of the New York papers, probably the Times, about uh, a school that had burned down because the uh, film projector overheated and caught fire. So, you know, I mean, these are things that were, were real issues um, and have been issues with technology use over the years. But the big one thing that I think becomes the biggest roadblock for us as educators is little to no instructor training. Now, I'm not talking about somebody coming in and telling you, okay, click here, and this is where you print, and this, you, know, you go here to do these functional things. I'm talking about training and really understanding what to do with it and how to use it to do things differently in our classes. Then last but far from least, the research finally trickles in and we find that when we compare technology-based instruction to traditional methods, using my air quotes, we get no significant differences. So then we just dismiss the whole business out of hand for a lack of ins underlying instructional sub substance. Right? Again, sound familiar? <laughs> we just went through this uh, a few years ago, or have been going through this over the last few years. In the end, unfortunately, the basic act of teaching gets changed very little. Over the last hundred years, despite all the hype, we end up doing things primarily the same way we had done them in the past. And unfortunately, for some reason, that baffles many of us, the, the technologies that have transformed a whole range of business, such as car manufacturing, retail, and others, have not had the same transformative impact on education. 
For education, like nursing and other labor-intensive sectors that rely on human act, interaction or activities, the technologies that we've had available to us to date simply haven't been capable of producing the kind of growth and productivity over time to transform the way we do business in education. Stated differently, it takes nurses about the same amount of time to change a bandage today as it did 50 years ago in 1969 when this picture was taken. And I would argue the same largely holds true for education. It takes college professors uh, the same amount of time to mark an essay today as it did 50 years ago in 1969. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a labor-intensive, human interaction kind of activity. This cost disease was first talked uh, about um, back in the 60s by William Baumel and Bill Bowen. You've probably heard Bill Bowen's name. He was the guy that started Ithaca S plus R and, and some other things. He was at, uh, at Princeton for a number of years as president. What they said was with technological innovations in some sectors, so I'm looking at this top row right now, productivity increases at a rate similar to or even greater than the rise in wages for the workers in that sec sector which, of course, results in a decrease in the cost per unit. The problem is with the introduction of those same technologies in other industries, so now looking at this bottom row, of which education is a part, the wages increase, but the productivity does not with the introduction of those same technologies, which results in an increase in cost per unit. So I know you guys are all starting to yawn. This is like way too much economics for this time of day, but <laughs> One of the really interesting observations that Baumel and Bowen made in all of this was that when this happens, the industries in that top row start exerting serious pressure on the bottom row to become more productive. And that translates for us into things like, you're not graduating enough students who have the skills we need. You're not, you're not, not doing your job. We need, you know, we, we no longer, we're questioning the value of higher education. All right, so that's depressing. Um, I don't mean to be a buzzkill, but the technologies that have revolutionized other industries and hold such great promise for transforming higher ed will never lead to meaningful change unless we find ways to break this cycle. We gotta start thinking differently about technology's role in what we do. So how do we do that? Well, let's take a step back and explore this assumption that simply inserting new bright, shiny objects into the mix can fix things and go back to our definitions. I was an English major. I, I, I always lose this one in these crowds because we've got so many faculty that are in various disciplines. But how many English majors in the room? A few, okay, see, we can find jobs. <laughs> Um, so I, was, I, I believe in the power of words, so I want to take, go, take a step back and take a look at, at our definition of this word technology. So if you ask many people, the average person, to define technology, they're going to point to one of these devices, right? Yeah, the cell phone in my pocket or the, the uh, you know, uh, laptop or whatever it might be. But if you look up the definition, you'll discover that most scholars view the term more broadly to mean the application of our knowledge about tools, techniques, or systems to solve practical problems. It's not really intended to be about devices. In fact, if you think about it a little bit, there are three things that should jump out at you. First, in some respects, it almost feels a little more like a verb than a noun. While it involves some sort of thing, tool, technique, or system, it's the application or how we use the thing that's key to this definition. Secondly, note that what's really actually being applied in the definition of, is our knowledge of the things. What do we know about tools, techniques, or systems that we can capitalize on? Um, this suggests that we have to have a keen sense of the thing's affordances or action possibilities that they provide upon which we might build. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit more about affordances in a minute. And third, the definition presupposes that there's actually some practical problem that needs to be solved. In fact, one might say, in the absence of that practical problem, it's not a technology at all. Stated differently, in order for technology to help us get results, we need to be very certain of the underlying problems that we're trying to fix and have a thorough understanding of the capabilities of the available tools, techniques, and systems to address those needs. So let's, let's walk through this a little bit together. 
What's the big thorny practical problem we're trying to solve in higher ed? Well, you know, I know each of your institutions are going to have smaller, more granular things that you're working on, but let's take a look at this larger issue. Um, and I think for us in higher education, it's about how we do more with less. Um, and I don't need to, to spend a lot of time talking about our situation today. Um, but as you know, during the past 10 years, the financial meltdown of the Great Depression of 2008 and its aftermath have created funding shortfalls and altered campus revenue streams, shifting higher ed from what economists perceived as a public good to a private good. What we're finding, of course, is that while the Great Recession has decimated state budgets, um, and we've had turndowns before. In the past, higher ed eventually recovered these dollars, but that's not happening this time. Only six states have had higher education budgets return to or surpass their pre-recession levels. In 19 states, expenditures per students are at least 20% lower than before the recession, leaving higher ed institutions scrambling to find alternative sources of revenue. And as you, of course you know, uh, Alaska has been in the news over the summer for the huge uh, uh, cuts that their governor proposed um, in that state. We've been pretty lucky in Maryland. Um, it's, you know, we've, all, we've all had budget cuts as well, but when you take a look at Kansas, Alaska, Wisconsin, some of these other states where they've had just these huge cuts, um, it's, it's uh, really, really disheartening. And unfortunately, the revenue that they're trying to generate in order to compensate, of course, is coming from students, right? So a recent study at a temple found that for every $1,000 in funds cut by the state, colleges raised tuition by about $300 about the cost of some of those textbooks, right, that we've, we've been assigning to our students. At the beginning of the last decade, college students who went to public universities paid for about one-third of their education. Today, in more than half the states, they pay for most of it. So quite a shift in um, the budget situation. In addition to that, we're seeing a real shift in our students and their needs. Um, so, you know, the non-traditional student, as, it, as these folks used to be called in the past, are becoming our new normal. And our community college partners, of course, have been very aware of this for, for many years. We're really beginning to see this shift in um, the four-year institutions as well. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, the 17 million Americans enrolled in undergraduate higher education today look very different, of course, than when I went to school and many of us in the room. One in five is at least 30 years old. One in four is caring for a child. About half are financially independent from their parents. A quarter take a year off before starting school. Two out of five attend a two-year community college before going to four-year. 47% go to school part-time at some point. And 44% have parents who never completed a bachelor's degree. In the uh, university system, we're now at a full two-thirds of our incoming students not being the, what used to be the traditional 18-year-old right out of uh, high school. So only one-third are, are those traditional students. Got to change our nomenclature on that. Unfortunately, too few of our institutions are adequately, adequately addressing these changes in the demographics, particularly with respect to these folks' constant competing tensions between life obligations and educational obligations, which, of course, sends the message to these folks that this place is not meant for me. Right, I'm, I'm not supposed to be here in higher education. We need to rethink who today's post-secondary students are and figure out how to serve their needs, but how do we do that while budgets are shrinking? I really feel like such a downer. Um, so what do we know about the tools? So if that's the, the need, that's the big practical problem, what do we know about the tools? Um, so the key to understanding what the tools provide is in having knowledge of what psychologists call affordances, as I mentioned earlier. An affordance is the relationship between a tool and an individual that affords opportunity for that individual to perform an action. Okay, what's that mean? Well, for example, a switch affords flipping, uh, buttons afford pushing, the knob affords twisting. The way each of these light switch fu switches function is pretty clear to most of us without needing additional instructions, right? There's nothing written on the wall there above that, that twisty thing. Affordance of a tool, the affordances of a tool can be used both to suggest and also help shape action. So you all have seen these kinds of trash containers, right, now where you can't possibly get the plastic bottle into the slit on the paper. It actually molds our action and helps us understand how to work with the tool. 
And in some cases, an affordance, uh, tools affordances can also create barriers to action. Um, so this is the cover picture on Donald Norman's book. If you've never had a chance to read it and you're interested in design, Donald Norman wrote the book called The Design of Everyday Things. Um, he's kind of my affordances guru. Um, and this happens to be the, the picture on the cover of that. I'm pretty sure this is probably not openly licensed, so we'll have to strike this from the videotape later. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> So in some cases, as I said, a tools affordances can also create barriers. And as another example of that, this is a tough room in which to teach a flipped active learning class, right? You know, this is a tool, if you think about it, the classroom itself, that is creating a barrier to us thinking differently about teaching and learning in that room. So with that understanding of the practical problem and the affordances of the available tools, the next step is to decide exactly how we're going to make best use of the tools. And even more importantly, figure out how we avoid the temptation to use the tools to do things in the same way we've done them in the past. This functional fixedness problem, as psychology's called it, was illustrated by a guy named Mayer um, in uh, several experiments he did in the 30s called the two-string problem. The participants were required to figure out a way to tie two strings together, even though when holding on to one, the other was out of reach. And there were, of course, a variety of objects on the uh, desk, as you can see illustrated there, um, that were suggested to offer a solution to the problem, and they were to figure this out. So as you can, and, and including one of those objects was a pair of pliers. So as you can imagine, most participants grabbed the pair of pliers and use them to try to extend their reach towards the other string, which didn't work. It still wasn't long enough. So does anybody have an idea what the, the non-psych people in the room, anybody have an idea what the solution to the problem was? Stand on the table. Stand on the table, that's a good idea. Uh, I'll just take the pliers and cut one of the strings and they hold it. Okay, yeah, that might work. I, they probably said, no, it has to stay connected to the ceiling, but that's all right. That'd do it. Well, in fact, getting the answer involved thinking differently about the other affordances of the pliers. Bonnie? Well, you're getting there. You're getting there. So uh, what at least one of the solutions was, was to tie the pliers to the string and set it in motion like a pendulum so it could be reached while holding on to the other string. So in addition to the reach affordance that you get with the pliers and the cutting affordance, and we don't want to forget that, <laughs> you also have the weight affordance, right? So thinking differently about the tool and the affordances and thinking about how it can help us solve problems. So this functional, functional fixedness, easy for me to say, in education is probably most clearly illustrated by this 1927 photograph that was uh, actually in the cover page or whatever of a book by a guy named Larry Cuban um, that he discovered in his research on constancy and change in the classroom. And I know this is kind of a fuzzy picture, but um, at first blush, can you tell what you're looking at here? Those who haven't seen it before? A bus, yeah, definitely something. This is actually a very unique opportunity in the 20s in Los Angeles for students to experience geography firsthand from an airplane. But what are they doing? What are, they, what are the students doing? They're looking at a globe. They're not looking out the windows, are they? Instead, their attention's focused on their teacher, pointing at a globe. She's actually standing under a clock and in front of a chalkboard. So essentially what they've done is they've taken the classroom and just moved it into this airplane, and they're not taking any advantage of the tools of affordances, like wings and the fact that it you know, actually could go to 20,000 feet or whatever and show kids geography. I love this picture. So let's take a look at this also in terms, this idea in terms of our recent experience, experiences with MOOCs. Thinking about MOOCs like that pair of pliers or the airplane, what's the one affordance that we've really failed to capitalize on if you think about massive open online and courses as being the affordances of a MOOC? We always, you know, courses not, you know, sure there were some things that they, that, that, 
we, we explored further with MOOCs in terms of courses. Um, we were doing online and have been doing online separately from MOOCs. Um, it's not really open. We can have a whole conversation about that. It's a whole different uh, environment. When you th it's free, um, and even now they're not all so free anymore. What I think we've really missed out on is the massiveness part. Sure, we exhausted the scalability part of massiveness, right? We, we you know, are teaching hundreds of thousands of students through these MOOCs. But what about the opportunities that massiveness can afford for community connections and worldwide collaborations among learners? What a golden opportunity for us to get people talking together globally. In fact, um, this connectivist vision, as it's called, um, is best explained by researchers such as George Siemens, who's down at uh, UT Austin, and Stephen Downs, who envision capitalizing on the MOOC's massiveness and form affordance in terms of what they call X MOOCs and C MOOCs. They said, sure, go ahead and teach hundreds of thousands of students basic content, right? Think Bloom's taxonomy. Get them up past those first couple of, of letter, layers in the taxonomy. Um, learning terms, you know, comprehension, maybe a little bit of basic application. But then bring them together in a face-to-face -face environment where a teacher can help guide them in authentic pro project-based application of the skills and concepts introduced in the X MOOC, then put them back out in the MOOC in what they call a C MOOC, that capitalizes on how the massiveness brings folks together to do things like crowdsourcing solutions to wicked problems and building community around doing. That's a real, that's, that's taking that affordance and using it to solve a practical problem and looking very differently at the massiveness piece to do that. So, you're all sitting here thinking, I thought we were talking about OER today. How are we doing with OER with respect to this whole idea? Well, I would argue that just like the massiveness of MOOCs that was going to scale education and solve all the ills in, in, uh, in higher ed and make it affordable and accessible to the masses, I would argue the freeness of OER has been the thing everybody has jumped all over. And there's no question that the OER movement has made huge strides in saving students money as well as improving access. And you know, you read through the posters here and see really the amazing things that we're doing with respect to that. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that's not wonderful. I think it is wonderful. But have OERs begun to change the way we do things? Or are we simply replicating what we've always done in the past? Are we simply swapping textbooks for OERs and calling it a day because we're saving students money? And is that enough? Like I said, I love free stuff. Free stuff got us on Jeopardy. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but um, so uh, UMUC um, was actually a Jeopardy question. So everybody knows the answer was? What's it? No, what is textbooks? <laughs> you don't get it, you don't get it, you know. You don't get a, a credit for that one if you don't do it in the form of a question. Believe me, one of the things that I think that is really important as we think about the conversations of OER is understanding, too, their various audiences, right? So there's some people for whom talking about free stuff is going to really get their attention. Right, so when I went to the legislature and I said, we need some support for our, our OER work, everybody got very excited. This is actually the picture of the bill signing. So in 2017, the most initiative was sanctioned, I guess, in law by the state government to help lead the OER work across the state. We got a whopping $100,000 from the governor. Now, I'm not, you know, no sour grapes here. Um, you know, that's money, as you guys are probably aware, the, the, the budgetary process in the state of Maryland is that money gets, the, the budget goes to, let me get this right. The, the governor creates the budget. The budget then goes to the legislature. All they can do is take away. They can't add to the budget. So the fact that not only did the bill pass, and this was the bill signing, but in addition to that, they added $100,000 to the budget in support of OER, I thought actually was really huge. And then about two weeks later, I got news from my colleagues at SUNY and CUNY that they had just received $8 million from Governor Cuomo. So, you know, that was the, that's all right. Um, I, I try to let Governor Hogan know that as regularly as I can. 
Um, and actually, just one more quick aside on that. Um, we did go back to the governor last year, and they were very interested in that. Um, as you know, um, some of the other uh, things that, education things with the Kerwin Commission and so forth sort of took precedent, um, and that I think is wonderful too. But we'll be going back this year, trust me. Um, so, so is, but the, the issue here with the free stuff is that as we really begin to dig into what it's going to take to scale and sustain OER adoptions at our institution, we're also beginning to come to terms with the fact that this is going to be a huge undertaking. OER curation, adaptation, creation, sustainability, that's, that's, no, that's no minor thing. We're coming to realize that the care and feeding of that free puppy isn't going to be so free for us who, as we already have discussed, of course, are facing fairly significant budget crunches. So several of us, as I, we are actually now collaborating with SUNY and CUNY and several other statewide initiatives, we're trying to figure out what is OER going to cost our institutions in terms of actual dollars and human resources. And we're beginning to kind of come to terms with that, what that is, and guess what? It's coming down to around $25 per student per course is, is sort of where we're at. What happens when the publishers fi are finally able to get their offerings of copyrighted materials down to $25? We're seeing this in the news all the time. I need to update this with the recent announcement from Pearson that they're gonna start this whole born digital thing and get their, their costs down to around $40 is what they're targeting. Or to take it one step further, what happens when the publishers bring the cost of copyrighted materials down to even less than what we calculate it's gonna cost our institutions to maintain this stuff? because they have the deep pockets to do that and frankly the expertise to do that. What then is the value proposition of open? And how do we sell that to our colleagues? I, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but how do we sell that value proposition to our colleagues, administrators, regents, the legislators? Do we just declare victory, pick up, pack up our bags and say, guess what, we got the cost down, that's what we were trying to do all along, or is there something else here that we need to be focusing on? Coming back to that whole conversation about affordances. While being free is awesome, the free part is a byproduct of the open affordance, I would argue. The open affordance basically says, or open educational resources are resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. Free is a byproduct. The affordances of OER are, you've, I'm sure many of you have seen this slide before, are the five R's. So this is our ability because of the license to retain these materials, make, own, and control your own copy, reuse these materials in its unaltered form or revise them, adapt, adjust, modify, improve, remix them in any combination we choose, and then redistribute them, share them out to others as long as we're adhering to the, typically the Creative Commons licensing that has been applied to them. These are the affordances that I think we should be focused on. Sorry, they got me holding a microphone and a slide advancer, so moving to the next page is a little hard. So what is it we're trying to accomplish? If we're thinking about our definition and these are the affordances, what is the thing that we're trying to solve? What is the problem we're trying to address? Well, of course it's student success, right? This is what we really are all about. Um, and the two big components that OER has been addressing in terms of helping students succeed, at least to date, has been this whole conversation around access and affordability. Unfortunately, these things, oh, excuse me, the third piece of the student success triangle, as I'd said earlier, at least in terms of our mission, the way we're thinking about it, is achievement. And unfortunately, these three things form the corners of what has been typically called sort of the iron triangle for education. And what I mean by this is that they've typically had a fairly reciprocal relationship with one another. So when you increase access, sometimes you can decrease achievement or, when you, or increase costs. Um, when you work to try to decrease costs, sometimes that can have effects on the quality of what you're offering and that can lower achievement. So it's been very difficult for us as educators to figure out ways that we can increase all these things at the same time. What happens when we further capitalize on the five R's part of being open and begin to start thinking about systematically engaging in revising, remixing, redistributing to improve student achievement in our courses? Is it possible 
for example, that OER is the super affordance of this iron triangle that's going to be, uh, sorry, now you have to read it upside down, that's going to allow us to be able to address the access and affordability, but because the materials are openly licensed and we can revise them, we can also start really addressing achievement. Now, some of this is being addressed through open pedagogical techniques. You guys may be aware of some of the open education things that are being talked about um, around you know, working with students to create their own OER, um, contributing back to, the, to the, the, um, uh, the commons and so forth in those ways. That's all tremendous. But what I'm talking about here, of course, is basically a continuous improvement loop. Getting, wearing my instructional design hat again, right? So what happens when we've got the data to help us understand what's working and what's not working for students in our instructional materials, and we're able to do that analysis, redevelopment, um, and, and put it back out there for students? That to me is really the really exciting thing about OER. That's, where, that's the value proposition of open that hasn't been getting talked about quite as much. So let's come back to that not so free OER puppy. I'm actually really seriously worried about this. Um, you know, as we look across the system and think about the institutions, including UMES, University of Baltimore, Coppin, Frostburg, that really, really need to be supporting their students uh, with this kind of work, they're probably the institutions that are less well, the least well resourced in order to be able to do this. How do we support that work? And how do we make sure that everybody is able to engage in it? I've been arguing that in order to sustain, we're going to have to find some ways to create efficiencies across the sector to avoid bankrupting the very institutions who are serving the students who are most trying to help. We need access to inexpensive digital rights and accessibility compliance services. I don't know if you all have started to dig into that, but if we're going to do that as institutions, which I'm not altogether sure we can or should be, that's going to be a heavy lift. UMUC discovered that when they moved entirely to zero cost materials. We need better support for curation, including national standards around meta tagging and cataloging OER for discoverability. And we need to get more systematic about that. So one of the things that I've been suggesting here in Maryland through the MOST initiative, if you know, every institution is going to curate materials for Psych 100, um, we're wasting a lot of time and effort. Let's coordinate that work and start parsing it out and, and sharing more. We need more OER materials at higher levels. I was speaking to a couple of folks this morning about the need for us to be developing in particular areas. In fact, um, nursing is one that comes up on a regular basis, but there are many others as well. We need training for faculty and students on how to teach and interact with OERs. We need to figure out how to support uh, our institutions when their bookstores start closing down. This was something actually the president of Chesapeake College brought to my attention. He said, ah, my bookstores pulling out because we're not ordering as many materials from them. So how are we going to figure that out? We need a set of unified standards and a system for review of OER quality and peer review of content. So this gets back to something that I've been talking about as well around faculty incentives. Um, again, had this conversation a little bit ago this morning as well too. How do we build recognition into the OER work that you all are doing to count towards your teaching evaluations in the same way that we build recognition for scholarly work to count towards your research contributions. This should be possible technically now, right? You're contributing resources into a, a commons, into a community that we should be able to track. We should be able to say X number of student institutions have adopted it, it, is, it has impacted this many students, and ideally, eventually, this is how they're learning from these materials. Those are things that I think are possible and doable and need to, to, to be put into place in order for us to sustain this and to incentivize our colleagues to engage. Last but not least, yeah, the system for, yeah, all right, that was the same thing. Not with money incentives, but with a reward system similar to that scholarly work that we do. So I'd like to spend just another minute or two on this last point, if you guys aren't already talking about at your institutions, at this at your institutions, but what I'm envisioning here is something like SOTL, the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning on Steroids. An opportunity for us to really leverage our activities as teachers to advance knowledge and knowledge practices in our professional and scholarly communities. That is a measure of our larger contribution to teaching that I think is going to be far superior to the student course evaluations that we typically work with. 
Now, I'm not naive. I know all you're sitting here thinking, ugh, the semester's just about to start, summer's over, I can't believe she's talking about all this work. Um, none of this is going to be easy. And, you know, I think really in order for us to do this work, we're going to have to adopt in our institutions, in the culture of our institutions, more of the spirit that Herb Simon uh, talked about when he said that we're going to need teaching to, to convert teaching from a solo sport to a community-based research activity. We need a lot more support for our faculty in engaging in this work and these conversations. Um, and again, that's a premise we're working on from uh, in the Maryland uh, Open Source Textbook Initiative. We did get a grant, uh, we're not entirely poor, we did get a grant after the t uh, 2017 Textbook Cost Saving Act passed, got a grant from the Hewlett uh, Foundation for a million dollars. Um, they were really excited about the fact that we were trying to build this infrastructure first. We, we're not, at this point, talking about scaling, which, quite frankly, is what SUNY and CUNY have been having to do in order to address Governor Cuomo's desires. We've actually been talking about building infrastructure and building collaborative spaces. And Hewlett was excited about that and wanted to support our work and, and learn from it. Um, so I've already talked a little bit about how the MOST initiative began, um, but it actually has been from that beginning grounded in the idea that the selection of course materials has to remain the prerogative of the faculty. The faculty are the ones that understand the content, they understand what's best for our students. If we're going to address that iron triangle, we can't be absolutist about OER. We recognize there are things that are missing, we recognize this, there's places where the quality may not be so good. But if we could at least get to the point where we're thinking about OER first, and we're at least looking to see if there are openly licensed materials available, and then we're capitalizing on what we can do with those openly licensed materials beyond just the fact that they're less expensive for students, I think that's a really positive place for us to be. So the mission, and I won't read through all this, uh, but the mission for the, the uh, MOST initiative is to support that statewide scaling and sustainability of these materials. And by the way, notice that it begins with fully accessible, openly licensed. We are talking, um, in fact, I was just, was it yesterday or the day before, up in Baltimore, talking to the folks at the National Federation for the Blind. We're partnering very closely with them. We're partnering very closely with the National Federation of the Deaf, or we will be. I'm trying to get uh, that conversation started. In order to figure out how do we also use this as an opportunity to get folks thinking first about accessibility and making sure that we get it right from the beginning this time as we're thinking about uh, the, the, not only the materials we adopt but also those that we um, uh, create ourselves. But the second part of this mission statement I think I'm really most proud of that really even in our mission again from the start we're thinking about empowering and rewarding faculty who capitalize on the opportunities that OERs are making available for us and for our, in, our students and our institutions. Um, so in order to achieve that mission, we're trying to shift the conversation. Um, that really is the point of my, my plenary here today. It can't just be about free, it has to also be about student achievement. Um, we're working to create the infrastructure for effective adoption and of course doing what we can from the system level and uh, across uh, statewide policies and so forth to develop processes, models, and reward structures for sustaining this work over time. And in fact, um, I don't have a slide for this, but in your folders you will find a one-pager on the most commons. Um, this is actually something we just launched about six weeks ago. Most Commons is a microsite, as it says, of the OER Commons. OER Commons is one of the major uh, uh, OER providers, databases, resources for curating, sharing, creating openly licensed materials. Um, it's actually supported by a nonprofit called ISCME, and I can never remember what ISCME stands for, but uh, they are essentially mostly made up of library folks. Um, they've created this platform. Um, the platform itself, actually allows for institutions to have their own sites on the platform. So, uh, in fact, we already have Frostburg set up and Prince George is set up with a microsite, is it, or no, a hub, as it's called. 
by is ISME, um, where you can actually, it's branded for the institution, you can create groups within the site. Um, so if you've got a department that's interested in, in collaborating around OER adoptions, they would have space in this as a group. Um, we can also create inter-institutional conversations because it's nested inside of the most commons. We're gonna be able to support conversations like we are already starting to up in Western Maryland with Allegheny, uh, Garrett, hopefully Frederick, and also Frostburg around adopting OERs for gen ed courses and collaborating on that. So we can support that group inside of this platform. They can compare notes and so forth. We're also looking at some other ways to support those kinds of, of um, collaborations across the state. So we're really excited about that. That's really sort of the first push to begin um, on this third bullet in terms, uh, or no, second bullet in terms of supporting effective and efficient adoption. Um, and we're gonna continue to be exploring ways that we can do those kinds of things. So, in conclusion, I gotta admit, um, <clears throat> as you've probably gathered, um, and as I said at the beginning, that I'm not altogether sure any of this stuff is really about OER so much, as much as it is about us thinking differently about teaching and learning and capitalizing on those affordances of the OER, not just to increase access and affordability, but also to really focus on, on the achievement. Because if we don't do that, if we don't, if we don't you know, get past um, the fact that we, ca we can't seem to, to do things differently despite the affordances of the tools, I think the publishers will end up winning this battle. And, and I try not to talk in terms of winning and losing because I think the publishers have been really good partners with us over many, many, many years. And in fact, we're looking at some new publisher solutions that are coming out. But you know, if we don't capitalize on that openness part to do things differently, we're gonna miss this chance to increase achievement. We're gonna miss this chance to engage in that continuous improvement of instructional materials and um, not realize the real benefits of the technologies themselves. So until we make that shift, we're gonna to continue to deprive students of the transformative power of technology, whether it's OER or one of the other many things that we talk about adopting in our courses. So I'll leave it at that. I wanna thank you for your attention, and I don't know where we are time-wise, but do we have a few minutes for some questions? I know you have a question. <laughs> I can, sir, yep, yeah. Phones? Yeah. Okay. Um, it seems like uh, my students are very absorbed in their phones. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of being oh, 75 years old. Uh, I'm kind of old school in a lot of ways. Um, I think it's all about you know learning to focus on things and not having distractions. And I keep sort of mentally trying to fight that battle. But uh, I know I'm losing this completely. And somehow, you know, I, I wonder, like when you develop OER, you know, should you be developing resources that are easy for students to access on their phones? Uh, you know, things like that. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I, and I think that's. I, just, I think, you know, phones, philosophically, I'm opposed to them. I think it's something that was, you know, wasted on society and it's just kind of become like a virulent cancer or something that just took over and it's infecting everyone. Um, and I don't know how to fight against it, but uh, probably I can't win that battle. I don't think anybody can at this point. And I just wonder how to incorporate, maybe a lot of people will figure this out, how to incorporate phones into their teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there, there are many who have experimented with uh, not just phones, but also laptops and other things that can be, serve as distractions in teaching. Um, I think OER, you know, certainly if we are developing OERs um, or curating OERs, we're gonna want to make them as accessible as possible across a variety of platforms that our students are using. Um, in terms of the audiences that we're trying to serve, you're right, everybody's got a phone. So, you know, and, and you know, why not go ahead if we're gonna do the OER materials and make sure that they're formatted and easily accessed on phones in order to make them as available to as many students as possible. So, you know, whole different conversation about techniques for, for, 
for teaching with phones, which we, we, we won't have time to get into today, but um, I think that you're right to observe that. And I actually think OER, the phones present a really great opportunity for OER to reach more, more learners, so. Yeah, I mean, I put all my materials on Canvas, and if, if students pull up their material, those things, I think they can pull them up on their, on their phone. Mm -hmm. Great. We'll get Cassie on that. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Yes, sir. You used the phrase I haven't heard before. What are alternative credentials? Uh, another conversation for another day. But uh, this would be digital badging, um, comprehensive learner records, um, instead of transcripts that reflect only uh, what students were taught, uh, reflecting what they actually learned in terms of competency development, those sorts of things. Well, you, that, that term stuck in your craw for a while. I think I said that right at the beginning. <laughs> I can talk more about that offline if you'd like. Yes, ma'am. So, um, one of the reasons I came here is because I don't know much about um, open resource. Um, but I did not know that the whole University of Maryland has converted into the no textbooks. Like, That's University of Maryland, University College. So, yeah, I didn't, oh, yeah. University of Maryland, University College. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it, did the slide say University of Maryland? Yeah. Yes, that's what it said. No, it said yeah. Yeah. It, 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 I think it was a word wrap. I think it said University of Maryland, and then on the next line, University College, so I can see oh, how okay. you would have been confused. Okay. Boy, I'd, I'd love it if they did, but no, um, not so far. Oh, uh, how did they do that? Yeah. And, yeah. So I'm like, okay. And, and but in that same spirit, um, when you look at, uh, I know university college is, you know, online. But how do you do something like that to the groups? Like you mentioned, COP, and um, there's us given the budgetary constraints yeah. and the audience and the demographics of the students that attend that they would benefit greatly yes. from o o you know OER. So. How do we tap into that? Because when you look at like University of College Park versus our financial aid here, ninety percent of our students here qualify for financial Pell. aid loans, things of that. Yep. Demographics. When you look at SU, I think the numbers are something like only like sixty percent mm -hmm. of their students. And then when you look at College Park again, the number goes lower. So for an institution that would benefit from something like that, how can we put that in motion for the population that would probably yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's what we're trying to do through most is figure out where we may be able to develop some shared resources to support all the institutions and raise all boats. So um, we're starting to develop some instructional design support resources. Um, we're talking about, and I, like I said, I'm going back to the governor, you know, how great would it be to see Coppin, UB, UMES, Frostburg be able to really start to address some of their students' economic needs through you know, much wider and more strategic OER adoptions. Frostburg just put OER into their strategic plan um, and they're really beginning to take a hard look, like I said, at Gen Ed and some of these other places where they can make a big impact. Um, so I'm asking the same question and trying to figure out how, how do we make this work? Interestingly, though, just so you're aware, um, there's a really great video that was developed by the, they call it Mary Perg. Maryland uh, Perg stands for? Public Interest Thank you. Public Interest Research Group, um, which is a, a national organization, but they have a student chapter on, on campus at College Park. They developed a really great video by a student who uh, you know, came in Pell eligible, um, who was, surprised to discover when he'd paid his tuition room and board, that wasn't the end. That now there's another X thousand dollars that he was gonna to have to ante up. He made it through the first semester, he wasn't gonna be able to afford to come back in the spring. You know, I mean, it, it happens all over, less so at a college park um, or Salisbury, but it, it's happening to students all over the place. And those are the ones we're supposed to be trying to work and address, right, and, 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 and retain. Um, so thank you for your question. We're working to try to, to address that. And that is a big part of the pitch that we're making to the governor. And it's true, too, for the community colleges. I mean, you go out to, to some of the smaller schools, Garrett, Cecil, um, Warwick, um, you know, they need support as well. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Uh, Southern Maryland. <laughs> okay. uh, you mentioned the, um, the kind of conundrum with publishers and what they're sort of putting out and getting back to market and things like that. Uh, I see that the publisher products have a lot of ancillary materials, yes. like the quizzes and the knowledge checks and all of these things that are really make it hard to kind of get away from that. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what so um, actually one of the reasons, that's exactly one of the reasons why we've partnered from the beginning with Lumen Learning. Um, they are an OER provider. They are a for-profit, but about as non-profit as a for-profit can be in their dedication to this conversation. Um, Natalie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Natalie is here from, from Lumen. Um, but because of that, because we knew right away faculty were going to be asking us for those ancillary materials, test banks and PowerPoints, all that stuff they've come to rely on, Lumen does put together course packs essentially um, that provide all those materials. Um, we have two options in um, our catalog from Lumen. One is what we're calling kind of those ready to adopt courses um, through their Candela products. Um, and then also the Waymaker product that adds a layer of analytics behind that. That one does come with some fees back to students, but Lumen is nicely giving some of that money back to the state of Maryland in order to support the most initiatives. So even if you decide to adopt one of those courses, it's some of that money still coming back to us to, to support the work that we're trying to do. Um, so, you know, increasingly we're seeing these, these OERs come bundled with these kinds of materials. Um, but you know, some of us are also still working on this. So a couple of our most mini grants this year, um, we're actually uh, funding um, the development of test banks for, was it algebra? Um, so you know, we're trying to, to also contribute back to some of that as well. But it's a, it's a concern and something that um, we'll have to address. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, Herb Simon. That, that uh, teaching should not be a solo endeavor, but should be collaborative. Um, so I'm thinking, um, you know, one of the appeals for OER, uh, about OER to me, is it seems like it provides a kind of a context for, I mean, I have these course notes, and I would like to make them almost into a book or manual or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But I think that runs counter to our teaching culture. Yeah. Um, you know, you're at the beginning of the semester, the department ends, you get your, your marching orders, right? You're going to teach these courses. And then you come back at, in December or whatever, you have the fall semester, and you got to turn in credits. And in between, you run a solo operation, right? Right. I mean, there's nothing built in institutionally unless you somehow go talk to your your colleagues and say, would you like to do something with me? But then there's no time. Right. So it's, it, you know, that potential, I think, is going to be shut down until we figure out how to change our culture. Yes. But maybe this is a tool that will make that more possible. And I also have wondered, so you go down the hall to talk to your colleagues. Remember, those are the ones that are evaluating your teaching, too. So, you know, that's a little fraught as well. You know, I've wondered about the extent to which some of these interinstitutional conversations may be even stronger than some of the within department conversations. But I don't know what that is. I mean, I can remember, too, when I started teaching, eh, 2000, um, at Lehigh, thinking to myself, this had to be all about me. I had to be the one to be, you know, I, they've, they've hired me to be the sage on the stage, so I darn well better be sagey, right? You know, that, that if, I, if I had to turn to somebody else and ask, and I can remember this one class where I had to start talking about copyright, and I'm thinking, holy cow, I know a little bit about copyright, but not that much. How am I going to manage this? At some point in the, in the middle of the discussion, terrified because I realized students were asking me questions I couldn't answer, I finally said, as they're sitting there with their phones and their laptops, I said, why don't you guys look up the answer? And you know what they did? And suddenly we were having a great conversation and they were teaching me as much and it was okay. It was okay for me not to be sagey. So I don't know how we get past that. I think slowly we're beginning to do that, but 
Um, I think that's, that's something you're absolutely right. It's a culture shift that's going to have to happen. Hopefully, this can help spark some of those conversations. OK, I think we have time for one more. Just following up on that, there's an institutional barrier to this in recording our effort. So Dr. Carell and I are, are teaching a course combined together, and we do this throughout our pharmacy program. But anything that you're teaching together, you have to split the right. power of credit for. Right. So we are each putting in the full time Right. However, we only get half of that credit. Yeah. So something needs to shift. Where are you guys at? Here. Oh, here. Guess what? I've got, I, I have at least a partial answer for you. We've just gotten approval from the regents to shift the workload, faculty workload report, to eliminate the course. We're, we're no longer counting course units, at least at the state level, as part of the faculty workload report for precisely this reason. If we're going to be innovative and if we're going to be a team sport, like Herb Simon said, we got to be able to do this kind of collaboration, and we got to not have to worry about this whole course unit thing. So it's going to take a little while for all of this to get worked out at the institution level, but we're trying to remove some of those kinds of barriers for exactly that reason. The other thing, too, you know, we're asking faculty to engage in high impact practices, get out in the field, get students into internships. That also wasn't counting for much on those faculty workload reports, as long as the metric was the course unit because we had to translate that in some magical formula in order to make sense. So we're working on it. Um, I don't have that answer, unfortunately, at the community colleges. I don't know how you all do that, but we now have a model for it. So um, if that's something you're finding is getting in the way, please let me know and we can, we can share notes on that. All right, well, I think we're out of time, ready to move to the next thing. I'm going to turn it over to Kathy to give you your marching orders. Thanks again for your time and for your questions.